Merry good evening. Um, thanks for joining. Um, this evening's uh, hopefully quite festive, warming, friendly live stream. Uh, it's the last one I'm going to do for the year, um, so I thought it'd be nice to take a look at some nice, vaguely festive photos and see how I would go about. So let's turn off my iPad. Um, I'd take some, have a look at some festive photos and see what I would do in Lightroom, maybe a bit of Photoshop to amp up that festive feeling even more. I am, of course, joined by some excellent festive editions. You might have noticed the tree, which doesn't have a name yet. Ideas in the comments. And we have Gwen, the magnificent owl, who is just the most wonderful uh, thing that I have bought, I think, probably all year. Um, £35, John Lewis. Isn't she great? She sits on my Christmas tree the um, rest of the time, but I thought I'd better bring her down for the live stream. Um, let's have a quick look at uh, Lightroom. Hopefully now we can see into Lightroom, and I want to have a quick tour through some of the shots that we're going to be having a look at. Um, we'll start with this one here. This is a shot in, uh, in Edinburgh. We've got some lovely Christmas lights. It's probably, I think, the most festive house in the entire city. Helped, of course, by a cat, which we'll come back to. We're going to have a look at a nighttime scene in uh, Dean Village. We're going to transform this shot because straight out of camera, it looks a bit shonky. Um, we're going to do some exposure blending with this image of uh, the Waldorf Astoria Hotel. We're going to take a look at this. We're going to take a look at how you can make your nice family snaps look even more festive. And we're going to have a look at some of the uh, shots that I did of uh, the um, Ox Venture Guild for their charity Christmas single last year. So this was a uh, very festive um, photo shoot that we did for their video. Um, this was the um, album art that they ended up using. And so I thought we'd have a look at some of those and maybe have a look at how I would go about editing those and the ones specifically of, you know what, that one, I've already done the edits. Let's reset that back to its original form. Uh, we've got some people in the chat saying hello. Hi, Secret Agent Sam. Thanks for the compliment for my great sweater. It is one of my most festive new sweaters. Uh, and Nate says, nice bird friend. And Snail Scribbles says hi. And Katie says, hi, Gwen. Yes, indeed. Hi, Gwen. Um, let's go and kick off with some photos, though. And I think let's kick off with uh, this one because it should be a fairly easy one to make some uh, to make some edits. Now, of course, the first thing we take a look at this shop is that all of the main stuff going on is uh, is right in the center of the frame. It's quite small. So I know straight away that we could do a pretty hefty crop on this and really focus in on some of those details. The cat in particular is really important in this shot. As I was so pleased that that cat decided to go and sit there when I was taking this shot. Um, uh, so yeah, we want to make sure that that cat is actually visible. So I think instead of um, our original aspect ratio, let's go four by five. That's going to just make it a little bit more focused. And I do like all this, um, these lights at the top, but I feel that I could maybe crop in further and have it very much just about the lights around the door, the steps and the cap. So I think I'm going to give that a little try. And I think that's what I did on the shot that I um, exported and had on Instagram the other day. Something a bit more like this. Oh, no, too much foreground. So, in fact, we can move it up something a bit more like this. Um, so this shot, just if anyone is interested, I've already gone away from it. Uh, I took on the Sony RX1, which is a great camera. Um, it was 1.3 seconds uh, at f5. I did have it on a tripod. If you're going to do nighttime shots, you're going to need to do longer exposures. So um, having a tripod to do like a second or more is great. And certainly when it comes to things like Christmas lights, having a full frame camera with a lot of dynamic range is really important because you want to be able to pull back that shadow detail but also you've got all those really bright Christmas lights. So you've got a big contrast between the darkness and then those bright lights. And so you need to be able to balance those out. So having a decent camera can really help. Um, but already I think this is looking a little better with this narrower crop. We have got this security light, which 
the eagle-eyed of you who might follow me on um, uh, Instagram may have seen this and I was really angry at myself that I didn't do anything about that before I posted it online. Um, it's there now, it is what it is, but really I should have done that, cropped in closer and made it all about this door and these lights and the cat and I think that is a stronger image because we can still see those lights. We don't need all of these down here. We don't need quite as much. The rest is a little bit superfluous. So I think this just looks much, much better. So um, let's start off by upping that exposure. We could probably maybe bring the shadows up just a little bit and bring those highlights back down because of course the highlights is where all of those Christmas lights are. So we can bring those back down. Not too much, otherwise it just go a little bit dim. Uh, somewhere around probably minus 50-ish. Still a, quite a long way. Um, but the, the white balance is a little bit off as well. We've got quite a, a green, sickly tone. So I'm going to increase the tint a bit more into the magentas. Something like that. And I'm going to warm it up ever so slightly as well. Let's have a look before. I don't know, but isn't the before and after that was... Okay, annoyingly... You know, I don't even know how to begin to go back and have a look at that. When I press before and after, what we're actually seeing is my previous finished shot rather than the raw. That is what it is. Okay, that's fine. Let's have a look at some um, some styles and presets because I really think this is it's quite a stylized shot already. We want it to look really festive. So I think putting in some really nice like filmic toning. I really love the Visco uh, presets. I think they look really, really nice. Um, I talk a lot in my other videos about how I use presets, and typically I don't just one-click press. You do a lot of other edits alongside those presets, and sometimes I'll even take my image over into Photoshop, and by using layers, I can stack different presets, one on top of the other, sometimes five, sometimes six different ones or more, so that you get completely unique uh, looks and color combinations so that your images don't just look like anyone else that's bought that preset pack. It's really important. Don't just one click. So yeah, I think I used A6 before and I'm going to use it again because I really think it looks nice on this shot. Um, it's made it quite contrasty, so I'm actually going to reduce the contrast. Maybe reduce those highlights a bit more. Up our shadows. So I already think this is looking really nice. Um, one thing we can do is we've got these um, bits of the building sort of pointing inwards because of the angle I was taking uh, my shot. So we can go to transform and by clicking this, we can basically straighten out these upright bits just by drawing these lines one and two. I mean, that's done a horrible job. We'll need to um, change our crop as a result to something like this. There we go. Looks a lot better. We've straightened it up. It looks like you're taking the shot straight on with the door rather than from below sort of looking up, um, which I think looks a lot better. Um, and yeah, that's pretty much all I think I would want to do with this shot. It looks really festive. It looks Christmassy. The cat's there. Maybe the cat's a bit dark. So what we're going to do, um, I'm going to use a radial filter, drag that onto the cat. Um, I don't want it to be just on the cat, otherwise it's going to look a little bit weird, but feather it out completely so that it's... Um, uh, it's feathered. I don't really know how else to say that. Um, and then we can just bring up that exposure. And as I do, you can just see that the cat becomes a lot more visible. You don't want to go overboard, otherwise it just becomes a splodge of white. And it isn't going to look good. But just enough so that that cat becomes a bit more visible, stands out a little bit more from that scene. Something like that. And now there you go. The cat is actually there, and that's nice. Um... Yeah, so I think that's good. Hello to everyone in the chat. Um, Danny McNamara is there saying hello. Um, my mum is in the chat saying that it would make a great Christmas card. Um, it could have. And somebody uh, with more forethought than myself may well have decided to print up some cards this year to sell. But I didn't because there we go. Shy Violet is also in the chat. Hello, Shy Violet. Um, yeah. Um, I'd like this to be quite an um, interactive stream, so anyone who's watching, if you do have any questions um, about anything, really, about my photography, um, about what I do, um, or um, any questions you may have had about your own photography, do please feel free to pop them 
in the comments. I will try and get to as many as I can. Um, I don't know how long I'm going to be streaming for, but as long as I fancy, really. Um, let's move on. Let's consider this one done. I mean, actually, it's not. Let's have a look at this light again. It's just poking out that bit of blue again now we did that fix. So we can use a spot removal tool. Hopefully, that will be enough to do the job. We can literally just paint over. It has not done a good job at all. Uh, it's on heel. We can just drag it onto a bit of stone. Something like that. Uh, you know what? I don't think that's done a good job. Let's get rid of that and we'll try it again, but we'll up the amount of feathering on the brush now because before it had no feathering. It was a very, very hard line so you can see um, exactly where it's been painted and where it hasn't, which is not great. So what we're going to do, feather, drag, and now I don't think you would tell that that light was there. Fixed it looking good. I am happy. No, I'm not. We can twist it just to straighten that line up. Now I'm happy. That's all it takes. Um, yeah, please let me know how you're doing. And if we're drinking anything festive along with the stream, I am on a uh, smoked rum with smoked cola. So it is a very smoky drink. It's basically like drinking a bonfire. And it's delicious, which I paired with a smoky campfire embers candle. So I'm all about the festive feels in this stream. Okay, let's go on to another picture. And this is, again, very, you know, it's dark and wintry. We've got the Christmas decorations on the door. We've got the cobbled street. To be honest, this is Dean Village, um, sort of roughly where I live. And it looks like this all the time. Um, but it is a very, very festive place. So I thought it would be a nice one to... Um, uh, nice one just to take a look at. Um, this is another one that has, hasn't... has It's come out okay out of camera ex in terms of exposure, but it does need some work, certainly with the colours, because the sky has gone purple and it wasn't purple. And all the building and down here is very, very green, uh, and it shouldn't be. So we can fix that up quite easily. Let's start, though, by upping the exposure, because it is a little bit dark. And again, we can bring up those shadows, because it's a very, very shadowy scene tone back that highlights um, it's very much in the uh, in the street light here and on the ground it's a bit much now I think what I want to do is bring the street light down more but I don't like how much it's bringing down the highlight in the road so this is a good point where rather than doing global adjustments to your whole image you would maybe do a bit and then we'll get more specific with the um, selective edits with the various uh, radial filters. So in this instance, we can do that and just bring the highlights down specifically on the street light so it balances in the scene a lot more. And I might even uh, up the exposure on this again a little later on once I've done some of the other edits. Um, just uh, So I'm just trying to keep my eye on the chat a little bit. I'm going to go in and answer some uh, um, answer some comments soon, but let's keep on going on this um, for a few moments. I'm going to change this crop a little bit, just drag it down here. I like the foreground because we've got all this great reflection coming off these cobbles, so I don't want to crop in too much because that's really part of the scene here. My camera was um, maybe like a foot off the ground in order to emphasize that foreground as much as possible. So I just think a little bit like that looks great. Um, now let's have a look at the white balance because it's definitely all over the place here. I'm going to up that purple tint because this the house is very green. So I definitely want to up that. Of course it is making the sky even more purple. But that's okay, we can fix that. I'm going to warm it up slightly. Mm, something like that is maybe okay. And again, it's a show me the before or the previous edit that I've done. It's annoying. Okay, anyway, don't know why it's doing that. You'd think I'd know how to use Lightroom by now, but apparently not. So to fix the colors properly, I'm going to use the HSL tab, the Hue Saturation Luminance. Now, that's where I do most of my color work because it may be that just grabbing the white balance slider and moving it one side or the other just isn't really going to do the job because it's changing all the colors. If you just want to change some of the colors, this is where you do that. So this sky is very purple. It shouldn't be purple. It definitely was not purple. So that's what we need to address first. So we can look down here at the purple and magenta sliders, grab that hue, 
and we can move it over back into the blues. So we can move it pretty much all the way down um, into actually the blue channel. So now we've got a properly blue sky overhead and already I think that's done a lot to bring this photo back to what it should be. Um, I'm not sure how much magenta there is actually in this. The way I always work, oh dear, wrong one. The way I always work with these sliders, in fact with pretty much all the sliders in Lightroom, is just to grab a slider, move it around, see what it does, and then you can work out exactly where it needs to be. Something like that I think is fine. Um, again, we've got a lot of green in the yellows of this brickwork. Should not be uh, green, so let's grab that yellow and we can move it down. Something like that I think is already looking a lot better. Um, we can maybe drop the oranges ever so slightly. If you go too far, it goes pink. But I do like the sort of a rich deepness deepness, there's a word, um, the depth that you can get from uh, from an orange when you do just push it a little bit more towards that um, towards that red area. Um, the greens I really like. Now, sometimes it's it, I kind of like pushing that green down to the yellows. You get a, a bit of a, uh, a dreamy feel from it. But because we've got these really nice uh, wreaths on the door, it's gone far too much the other way the holly wreaths and the bushes around here. I want to make sure that that stays like a vivid, vibrant um, vibrant green. However, I don't love it quite so much on the, um, uh, the moss on the brickwork down here. It doesn't really bother me too much. Um, if I really wanted to change that, I would take it into Photoshop and then I would selectively do that area, move it across. Um, I wonder how much I could do in the hue here. Maybe if I just bring up a graduated filter we drag it up like this firstly i'm going to darken it a little bit down just to emphasize that shadow in the foreground a little bit more and we can maybe grab the hue here now this is going to drag the hue of everything in this filter not just the green so i want to be careful what happens if i press use fine adjustment i have absolutely no idea absolutely no idea I don't think it's doing anything that I can say. It's certainly not changing anything. But I think that looks a little bit better, just having done that. And I'm also going to increase the clarity specifically on here because that is really going to help, as you can see, bring out that detail in the in the bricks, bring out that it, um, the reflection that we've got. It really kind of emphasizes the, the rain that's fallen on those cobbles. Um, I think it looks really nice. You don't want to go overboard, but it gets very grungy very quickly. But I think something like plus 20 works really nicely here. Um, what about those highlights? You know what? I actually want to boost those highlights a little bit. Because that is the reflection. That entire reflection is just one highlight. So anything I do to those highlights is going to change that. But I think that's already looking pretty nice. Um, again, we can have a look through at some of the presets. But actually, we can't really. Because these presets are going to be taking our color toning back to what it was before we changed our HSL. So we're not going to bother with that. Instead, let's have a look at the tone curve. I want to add a little bit of filmic fade. And I'm going to do that with a tone curve. I'm literally just going to bring up the bottom of this tone curve. As you can see, the higher I bring it, the more it gets that kind of faded look. I think something around there looks kind of cool. And we can have a play around with the others with those highlights, but I don't really want to do a lot else with those. Maybe something around there. Um, I also might want to add just a little bit of blue to the shadows, which we can do in the blue channel of a tone curve and just drag up the shadows. The higher up we go, the more blue we add. Don't want loads, but just a little bit gives that sort of cinematic quality. Something like that, it, I think, looks really nice and has given it a much, I think, a really nice festive feel. It gives a a slight sense of that the blue in the shadows that it's it's a colder wintry night on the outside but you're looking into the lovely warmth um in those in those windows with the orange glow which i think is really nice um i do want to uh redo this crop though because we've just got some cut off windows here and i don't really want those so i'm going to bring it in also just going to twist it so that this uh line of the house is um is straight and I'm going to bring it in a little bit more this side as well. Something like that. 
Um, yeah, I'm pretty pleased with that. I don't think there's much else, if anything, I would want to do with this shot. I think it's, um, I think it's pretty nice. It's pretty festive. Um, let me know what you think in the comments. Um, we've got lots of uh, lots of comments going on. Uh, David Galante says, "Hi, I just want to ask your opinion on old professional cameras. I live in South America, and the prices are really a problem." Um, he means that uh, new cameras are really expensive. He says. Um, I mean, if you can buy secondhand cameras, then absolutely you should do. Um, depends on what you mean by old. Um, maybe you mean used from maybe a couple of years ago, like buying a Canon 5D Mark III rather than buying a brand new Canon 5D Mark IV, in which case that's great. Um, just make sure that kind of you know what you're getting if you're buying from a reputable retailer um, so that you've got a little bit of fallback if you have any problem. Personally, I don't love buying from some guy on Gumtree or eBay. Um, uh, so, um, yeah, maybe there's a, there's a camera store that sells secondhand gear, but definitely do that. I've, um, I, I have sold my gear to companies like that. And I know that it's gone to them in perfect working order. It just has been kind of surplus to what I need. So yeah, you can get some really good stuff and definitely a way of saving money, um, when you don't need to, and you can pick up some absolute bargains. Um, okay, let's move on to a, another one because I'm quite happy with this. I love this shine on the stones. Um, and in fact, Shai Violet as well in the comments says, loving the shine from the streets stones. Uh, Danny McNamara says, put in to lose to lose my cat. He would love to go wandering around here. Um, he is unfortunately an indoor cat because there are quite a lot of uh, foxes around here which have been known to take cats. So I don't want him to be in any trouble. Here's what we're going to move on to, though. It is a shot of the Scott Monument in the heart of Edinburgh, and I took this as a snap the other day. It's on my iPhone. You can see up here, iPhone 12 Pro Max, um, blah, blah, blah. This I shot, I believe, in Apple's Pro Raw, which I'm now allowed to talk about. Um, it's their DNG format. Uh, so basically, it is still raw, like taking raw on any other photos but it does still use some of their um, computational photography, as they call it, so like HDR blending for a better base image. Now, frankly, straight out of camera, this doesn't look great. It looks very, very dark, but there is all the information that we need in the shot. Um, Lightroom hasn't yet been updated to properly um, support Apple's Pro Raw, so which is why it kind of looks a bit shonky right now. But very quickly, we will see we can bring this image back to something a bit better. So, of course, we're going to have to start off by really ramping up these shadows because all of the buildings, that is the shadow detail, but look how much we can do that. Way more than we need, and we still capture loads of detail. If we, if we zoom in, we've still got so much detail on this brickwork, so much more than you'd be able to pull back from a standard JPEG. So we can bring that up quite a lot. Same with the highlights as well. We can really bring those highlights down in the sky, pretty much all the way, in fact, because I really want to capture that uh, the depth of those colors, the, the lovely tones that we've got in the sky. It looks great. Um, I'm also going to just adjust the, uh, the white balance. This was a lovely evening sunset scene. I want to emphasize that by adding a bit more magenta in, something around there, and I'm going to warm it up slightly as well straight away turn that off again it's annoying i'm seeing my I'm before and after i'm seeing the previous edit i really don't know why so annoying um anyway doesn't matter you can see how much of a difference those couple of edits just in these two tools has already made we brought out tons of detail and we've got a really really nice bit of color so first thing i'm going to do however is go down to our transform because the angle that we've taken it these buildings are pointing inwards they're leaning into the street and um, they don't really do that of course because they've been built properly so we can grab the same tool we used before and we just drag these guides down one side of this building one side of the other and then it pings it into place and everything has been straightened up now of course we've now got these white uh, blank spaces at the edges where it has transformed the photo but that's fine because we can just crop in as we were going to anyway something around there which I really like because if you just look the edge of the crop 
is just on the edge of Jenny of Jenna's. We haven't had to cut that off, so I think it looks really nice. So there we go. Already we've got a much better looking image. I'm very pleased with this so far. Um, still plenty more that I want to do. Uh, first of all, how do I want to do this? I've got a couple of ideas. Hmm. First thing, actually, I'm going to do is I'm going to bring up a uh, adjustment brush. I'm going to click select mask, uh, view select mask, so we can see where we're doing our mask. And I'm just going to paint on top of the Scott monument because I just want to increase that brightness a little bit, help it stand out. Now, of course, if we just go and increase the exposure now, uh, let's just okay turn off that mask, then you know it's going everywhere. It's going all over the sky. It's terrible. It looks awful. So what we need to do is use a tool called range mask and if we just go onto luminance that means brightness then now if we click show luminance mask we can see exactly where that mask has been applied and it's been applied on the dark part of the building but it's also bleeding out into the sky we fix that by grabbing the bright part and basically telling Lightroom do not apply this mask in the bright areas i.e. the sky and as we drag that down it'll disappear if we go all the way down you can maybe just still see it's in the very dark shadows. We want it on the building. So somewhere around there is where it's applying to the building itself, but not in the sky. It's very, very simple to do. You don't need to do complicated cutouts in Photoshop. One tool, dead simple. Now we can bring up that exposure. We can bring up the shadows. I'm also going to bring up the white a little bit but I'm also going to bring up the clarity. Now that is going to help keep some of that detail in the building. Um, we don't want to go too far, otherwise again it gets very grungy, but it's just enough to bring back some of those details that we will have lost by increasing those shadows as much as we have done. But I do want this building to pop out. I want it to look um, like it's very much kind of the central hero of the scene. So that's what we're doing. Um, Got some nice comments. Uh, thank you very much. Um, Secret Agent Sam says it's like magic. Um, and Gentle Mandrill says that is a cool trick. It is a very, very cool trick. And when it, it hasn't been out long, I say it hasn't been out long, it's probably been a couple of years now, but when they launched it, it really was one of those very like revolutionary tools. Uh, and Nate says, great tip, never seen that done effectively before. Well, that is how you would use it. That is Nate Langson, uh, my brother, by the way, who, uh, if you are interested in drumming, you should go and check out his channel, Nate Langson Drums. He is a superb drummer, um, particularly um, does metal drumming, and he has an absolutely mind-blowing Roland digital drum kit, which is basically multiple very expensive high-end digital drum kits that he's somehow managed to push together and it all works as one kit. It's amazing. So do go and have a look if you're interested in uh, drumming or digital kits. Um, he didn't ask me to do a shout out, but I'm uh, just a very, very nice person. Okay, um, let's go and have a look now at our HSL again, because these colors are great, but I think they can be even better. And we're going to do this by playing with the hue. So definitely, I think, uh, the yellows in this. They're again that kind of sort of sickly greeny yellow a little bit. I want to bring that down much more into the um, into the orangey purpley yellow. Look at the difference kind of that makes. It's a much warmer color. I want to do the same with the oranges. Bring them slightly down into the into the reddy pinky tones. Let's have a look at those blues. Um, I don't really want to do anything. I want to bring them a little bit because where they were before because of the magenta shift we did in the white balance, the blue started looking a bit too purple. So I just want to bring that down a little bit towards the cyan. On the aquas. The purples, though, we can pretty much leave in the middle. Because we don't want to push them back into blue because we added that magenta intentionally. We wanted some, some nice warm tones. So already I think this is looking pretty good. Um... I do want to do some more selective edits though, and I think what I'd like to do, and we're going to view the mask, is I'm going to just paint in a bit here and sort of try and feather it myself down here, and a little bit the same 
on this side of the building too. And again, with this mask, I'm going to use the uh, range mask, luminance, drag it down from the highlights, drag it down from the sky. And what I'm going to do, turn that off, and we're just going to bring up that exposure, bring up those whites, basically the same that we did on the Scott Monument itself. But I wanted to have it's already got this sort of kiss of that sunset coming in. You can see that it's brighter at the top of the building than it is in the bottom. I'm just trying to emphasize that a little bit more. That's always kind of the thing with, with these shots and, and certainly the way I like to do with my photography and I think works really well with any kind of um, these sorts of festive edits is not about adding in loads of things that aren't there. It's not about adding in wild colors and compositing things in, unless that's your style but it's about kind of emphasizing what is already there. In this case, that light was there. We just want to punch it up a little bit more. But I think that's kind of everything that I would want to do with my selective edits. And I think it's looking, looking pretty nice. We've got details in the building down here. We have got some people in the bus down here. Sure, might have been kind of nice to have a totally empty street. And I'd like to go back at night and do a long exposure so you just get those headlights of cars streaking as like lines blurred lines going down the road i didn't do that it's in the middle of the day no, it wasn't it was about four o'clock half past three but that is when the sun sets in scotland um the last thing i want to do in this shot though is go down to our color grading this is a new tool that lightroom has added it used to just be called um uh split toning where you could add tone only to the shadows or the highlights. Now you've got shadows, mid-tones, and highlights. So I want to add in a bit of magenta into those shadows. That is immediately, as you can see, giving that lovely sort of sunsetty warmth. I think that's looking real nice. And in the highlights, I'm going to add some more orange. I'm going quite overboard with these two, but if we turn that off and on, that make, does that make such a difference? That really, really amps up that warm cozy sunset feel suddenly it's gone from you just wandering down a nice street and it's a nice view and now it's oh you just want to walk down there with a hot chocolate and a nice scarf maybe a sweater um yeah i think that's i think that's made so much difference um i tend not to do loads of the midtones i might have a little play add a little bit more orange a little bit less something like that you can also play with the um brightness of the midtones i might bump that up just a little bit and then you can decide on on how much of this tone is being added and you can decide on the balance of how much of the shadows to the highlights you want and i kind of wanted to keep it i think fairly central i like that we've got quite a lot of magenta in those shadows and quite a lot of orange in the highlights let me know what you think it's been quite a big edit but i think that's uh I think that's pretty nice. I think I, I like that. I shared this on my Instagram um, a few days ago, and um, well, no one cared. But I think it's quite nice. So let me know what you think. Uh, Shy Violet asks, how difficult was it to get into Lightroom when you first started using it? Is it beginner friendly? Um, I don't remember because I started using it a very long time ago um many of that i think when it pretty much first launched and it was a very different piece of software to what it is now um i think personally i think it is quite beginner friendly because everything is laid out um so easily and it, it is very easy just to grab a slider and look at what it does and you can go oh okay there's a big bright highlight and then you can bring it all the way down and you can it, it's very it's very easy to see those changes and to experiment. I think it allows for a lot more experimentation than uh, something like Photoshop where you've got to load in a particular tool and you've got to work with layers and all this stuff. I think Lightroom is definitely a good place to start. Um, I th also think it's more user-friendly than Capture One, which is designed very much for working professionals, whereas Lightroom is very much a everyone sort of thing yes professionals use lightroom i use lightroom professionally um but also beginners will use lightroom um also lightroom uh this is lightroom classic lightroom cc that you can also get on the ipad uh is even more user-friendly and is superb has basically all the same tools 
I use it all the time. It's, it's amazing to use on the iPad. Um, I do a lot of my edits on my iPad and in fact loads of my edits on my phone, particularly when I'm shooting out on location. Uh, Nate says, what difference will it make when Lightroom adds Pro Raw support? Um, it's difficult to know until they add the support, but um, I think one of the things it will do is hopefully make it uh, make the raw file before you've done any work look closer to what it did when you took the image, which is the point of Pro Raw, is that you're not taking a, a pure raw file. You are taking advantage of some of Apple's, um, uh, the way it takes its photos. So for example, on this shot, I'll just very quickly just reset it back to uh, to nothing. As you can see, it's very, very dark. Um, so if this doesn't look like an HDR shot, it doesn't look like Apple has, the like the iPhone has taken uh, multiple images and blended them together in a way that it, it would have done for a, a JPEG. Um, but it has done that. As we've seen, as we've been able to see by the amount of detail it pulled back, it has captured that shadow detail. It just isn't displaying properly in Lightroom and they display differently in some different apps. So it's very weird. And also when you look at, when I look at this raw file in my, uh, in my camera roll on my phone, it looks very different to when I load it into Lightroom. So it's just a compatibility thing. I don't think it's gonna make any major difference. Um, but there we go, that is enough for this one. Now the next one I wanna do is this shot of some friends and their adorable little baby um, when we were on a nice um, walk uh, with a rainbow. And I think this was a heron that was flying by. There definitely was a heron flying around. This may have been a heron. Um, I wanted to do a, uh, just a, a quick edit on this to kind of show some little tips that you could use to really kind of give like your family snaps a boost. And this is just a standard JPEG taken on the iPhone uh, when we're out and about. Yes, I was lucky to get a nice rainbow and a nice bird overhead. And yes, they're adorable. So of course it's easy to take a nice photo. But let's just do a few things. And I'm going to start off by having a look at some of the presets. Again, it's a very, very quick way of editing to give you a, a jump start with a preset. It's a good way of getting some inspiration of the sort of look you want to get from your image. Because as, as I'm sort of hovering over each one, we get a different look. This one's adding much more blue tones. This one's doing all kinds of things. And as we move down, we get different looks. We could even go into black and white. So, you know, they are good, but as I say, you don't just want to one click and leave it. So I'm actually going to do A6 Raw. This is one of my favorites. Um, we're going to bring the highlights down, up the shadows a little bit. We can't go overboard because it looks very, very weird and HDRE very quickly because we're working from a JPEG rather than a RAW. But I want to boost them just a touch to bring out some more of the detail here. I'm going to warm the scene up by a few dots. Maybe add a little bit of magenta in there for red as well. Ugh, again, can't do it. We can see with my edit I did before, but... Oh, well, um, okay, that's actually pretty straight, so I'm not going to do a lot with that. Um, it's very bright down here. Um, the jeans are quite bright, so I'm going to bring in a, uh, a um, linear filter, drag that up, bring down the exposure quite a bit, just to really kind of darken it down. And what that does is, is draw your eye more towards the center of the frame. Naturally, your eye will be drawn to the lighter parts in an image. So use that if you know that that's the case and you can use that to your advantage by, by darkening down the areas you don't want. We can add in another one and kind of take control of the sky a little bit more. Just bring that down, which brings out some of the cloud detail. It's also helping us see the rainbow a bit more, but I'm gonna deal with that separately. Um, but I'm just going to work on these guys first, and I'm going to put in a larger radial filter, something around this size, and brighten them up specifically. But I'm then going to put in a second one. Uh, oops, didn't mean to do that. I'm going to put in a second one over the top of the baby so that I can just specifically just really, he's the focus, he's the hero of this image there getting in and cooing and kissing and stuff, but he is the hero of this shot. So we wanna make sure that he's properly visible. And there we go, that's made a lot of difference already. Um, with that rainbow, I'm going to bring up a adjustment brush. 
and I am literally just going to show selected mask paint up and down over it like that and we can turn that off now I'm going to slightly increase that exposure cool it down or maybe warm it up as you can see you know you, you can basically add color cold or warm with the by using the temp in this way and I just want it I want that rainbow just to pop out a little bit more so I think I'm going to warm it up slightly maybe add a little bit of magenta so we get we keep those nice red tones on the um, on the edge and of course we can try and up the saturation don't want to go too far where it starts to look very unrealistic something around there maybe the whites just a touch bit of clarity I think that's done quite a nice job but I'm just actually going to uh, get the erase brush and just feather it off down towards the bottom so that it doesn't look too fake over the top of those trees there you go that rainbow is now much more obvious and they look um, much better and that was a few minutes work I've only used tools up here I haven't even gone anywhere down here we can do we could go to our color grading and we could add some uh, blues in those shadows we can add a bit more warmth in those highlights but we don't need to and in fact I'm not sure we really needed that yeah, let's leave it on why not and I think we're just a, a few little tools we've made this from quite a nice snap into a really really nice family photo which um, uh, I'm sure it would be really, really nice printed and framed and put up somewhere. Um, David says the rainbow is a little hard to see. It is. Hopefully now um, uh, it's a little bit more obvious. There's not if there's not loads that I would want to do to really make it pop out too much. If it isn't really vibrant, I don't want to make it look too vibrant. Otherwise, it will just end up looking too fake. Um, but hopefully that's just giving it a little bit more pop. Let's turn those off. I don't like it. But what I'm going to do is just play around with the hue. Maybe drag that yellow down a bit. Because those trees in the background are very, again, sickly yellow. And I think that's because of the, it's, it's just a JPEG and it's the white balance that the camera's gone for. Bringing those down into more of a orangey brown tone I think looks much, much nicer. But that's the only thing I'm going to do. Yeah. I'm pretty happy with that. Let me know what you think. Um, do you like this one? What would it be like with a vignette? What would it be like with a vignette? Where is the vignette? Here it is. Mm. Vignettes on family photos can very quickly become cheesy. If we put this in, it's, oh, isn't it lovely? Or even worse, the white edge. Isn't that? No, absolutely not. But a little bit, just again, helping draw the eye towards the center of the frame uh, is maybe just enough let me know what you think of that i think that's pretty nice um let's let's move on let's actually move on and have a look at one of the um ox venture um images because i think this is the one that i um i sent to them that they used for the album art for their christmas single last year um which did incredibly well they they did some amazing fundraising for the charity mind i'm pretty sure they got somewhere around eighty thousand. Um, maybe someone will be able to tell me exactly what that number is. And that was last year. It's probably gone up by now, if it's still open. Um, they did an amazing job, and it was a really great day doing these and uh, doing these shots. And we took a whole bunch, and there's a few of them just sort of like messing around and stuff, which is which is dead nice. Um, they're a really fun bunch. Um, that's the one I did, and I think maybe let's have a look at this one with Johnny, their their DM in, because I think that's a uh, maybe this one. Or this one let's go with this one this one looks pretty nice no this one this is the one let's do this so this is the straight out of camera version we can see plenty wrong in that we've got the light overhead we've got a cable power cable for it here um, the lighting in this isn't anything necessarily special um, it is a custom lighting rig that one of their guys made but it's just an overhead light you can get that with this positioning your subject under a nice light this isn't thousands of pounds of specialist photography equipment with amazing light modifiers on the front this is a bunch of light bulbs in a ring if you're 
in a nice park somewhere there might be a nice overhead light it's all about how you position it because they're under the light but we had them stand back from it a little bit that light is falling actually across their face rather than just on top of their head so it's just about positioning them and i sort of did suggest you tilt your head up just a little bit just a couple of degrees it's enough just to allow that light to fall um, on your face anyway that's if you care about lighting we don't care about lighting. We're doing some edits. Let's have another little drink. Hmm. I was stuffing my face with crisps before because I haven't eaten really. Um, I haven't had dinner. So I got some nice crisps. But I won't eat on the stream. That would be incredibly rude. Drinking's bad enough. Um, okay, let's begin. And I'm going to crop in um, probably a 4x5, which I think is going to look nice. The last one we did was square because they wanted it as album art, but I don't think we need to go square for this one. I'm going to straighten it up slightly, making sure that it's all nicely centered. Everyone's in, but we're not cutting anything out. Um, Ellen's elbow is coming around here, so I don't want that to be cut off. And similarly, we've got Jane's dress over here. I think this looks really good. That looks decent. Everyone's nicely centered, and it means that we've got rid of this cable, we've got rid of this light, we've got rid of this tree trunk, we've got a really nice neat scene. It's required no photoshopping, it's just a crop. Dead simple. A good crop is a really great way of controlling your shots. Okay, let's dive in. Straight away we can adjust this white balance, it's very very warm, we don't want it to be that warm, we also don't want it to be this cold. We want natural skin tones, so let's go somewhere around there. I think looks good. Um, we've still got a little bit of warmth, but we've got actual proper skin tones going on. Um, we definitely need to increase those shadows. Also could do with increasing the exposure overall just a bit. Now, I'm not dragging the highlights yet. Crucially, Luke being tall and at the back, he is, and also I think standing up over the others, is closer to the light. He is therefore more lit than anyone else. He's lit. Um, I'm sure he'll agree he is very lit um, so if we drag that highlights down it's dragging it down on him but it's also killing all of the highlights everywhere so I don't want to do that much so what I'm going to do is just bring it down a bit somewhere around there so that the highlights on everyone else's face still looks really nice um, but on Luke's and on the others we're going to do selective edits and if, this is, if you are trying to do a an edit of multiple people in a scene and if you're struggling to kind of balance the light don't think about your image purely in terms of increasing the exposure pulling down the highlights pulling up the shadows you've got these selective tools that make it so easy to edit people's faces in different ways because presumably wherever they're standing as they are here some are more in shadow some are brighter and so they need to be treated in different ways so in this instance let's start with luke fortunately he's slightly further away from the camera and i took this at um f 3.2 so he's not quite in focus um but that's fine he doesn't need to be in focus he's um he's a big boy um we can literally drag this circle over the top of luke and now we can bring down those highlights all the way make him look very odd just enough so that he's now balanced with the rest of the scene so now we go out and now we no longer have that bright harsh highlight um, on luke's face it's now balanced everyone else is looking good same with jane a little bit on her forehead um, because again it's closer to that light we can just bring in a brush bring down that highlight and just gently brush in that and there we go now that's balanced with the rest of her face there's no extra highlight there it's been nicely brought under control uh johnny for example here in the front is a little bit um in shadow so we can bring in that circle oh, it's bringing in our previous effects and we can maybe increase the exposure increase the shadows something like that and we can maybe put another one in on Ellen. Uh, reset that effect, increase that exposure, increase the shadows, bring back those highlights to about there. And so now with just those selective tools, kind of everyone's face is now being balanced for the exposure. Everyone's 
pretty much where they should be before. You know, Johnny was very, very dark. Look at how much darker Johnny's face is compared to Luke's. Now it's much more balanced. So we've got a really good place to do to start doing slightly more creative edits. Uh, Secret Agent Sam says, do you recommend always finding the crop you want before you start editing? Um, yes, if you... It depends if you need to. In this shot, because we had um, all this extra stuff on the outside, I knew that I was going to crop. So if you're starting an image and you know that you're going to need to do a crop, then yes, then it's a really good place to start because then you're not getting distracted by, you know, if I was up in the exposure thinking, oh, well, the exposure on this tree is doing this and the exposure over here is doing this because it's not going to be in your shot, so you don't need to worry about it. Whereas this way, uh, on this shot now, we've done our crop and so we know that this is how it's going gonna, it's gonna, to how it's gonna look. So there we go. Um, let's we can have a look through some of our styles and presets again, which I definitely think I used. I don't remember which ones. Oh yeah, I think it was these ones. A five raw because we get that lovely um, sort of filmic blue tones in our shadows. Doesn't that look so nice? However, Luke, why are you still overexposed, my friend? Can keep bringing him down a bit. Oh dear, not that much. He won't like that. Something around there. What do we think? Too much? I think we're good. Um, I mean, doesn't everyone look great? Isn't it? Isn't it just absolutely infuriating? Like these guys, they're all so nice. And they're all so bloody good looking that it's impossible to take a bad photo. Every single one that I did, and I took hundreds. They're all all good and they know how to they know they know what they're doing they know how to pose johnny knows how to make a good face he knows what he's doing um but we can now go in and do some more selective edits and there's quite a lot of selective edits that i think i want to show you um one of the things we want to do luke's rough around here i'm gonna i'm gonna treat all these different bits separately bring down the highlights up the clarity because i want to bring out that detail and look how much that does that it's gone from being almost totally washed out, and now we've got. Well, you can see the detail of that of the of that uh, of that sheep uh, sheep fur wool. That's what sheep fur is. It's almost like I forgot the word wool. Um, so that's looking really good. I actually think I'm going to do another clarity boost on Luke's hair. This is going to help it pop out a little bit more, and also just make it a bit more crisp, so it look a bit more in focus. Um, somewhere else where we definitely want clarity is on Andy's face, his beard, and his hat. Um, Andy's character, Corazon, is a pirate, as you can probably tell. He's a burly, he's a rough and tumble guy. He, um, you know, he wants to be he wants to be seen as being this manly dude. And clarity, quite frankly, is the way to do that. But if we just have a look at what would happen if I just ramped up the clarity on everyone. It looks horrendous. It's crunchy and contrasty and everyone just looks bad. We don't want that. And that is, again, another reason why we need to use selective edits. So we can go back in on Andy's face, bring up this tool. We've got our clarity up already and we can start brushing it in on his beard. And look how it now brings out the detail in his stubble and around the moustache as well. The more we bring that up, the more it kind of carves out those hairs it gives it that very grizzled look it's great but you don't want to do it on the whole face if you did it on on eyes and on skin and that skin suddenly becomes very like gritty and doesn't look great so you just want to use it very sparingly and that's why using the brush tool for clarity is great and again on the hat if we paint that in look it's suddenly bringing out all the details in that material it looks like it's then a really old weather-worn leather hat i don't actually think it is um, but it suddenly it stands out. It looks really, really cool. So um, just a couple of edits on Andy, and I think we've done some really good stuff. I'm going to do one more just on his eyes just to slightly brighten it up because his eye sockets are slightly in shadow. So let's just exposure a couple of bits just like that. Tiny adjustment. Maybe no one would have noticed, but I would have noticed. Um, that's looking pretty good. Um, what else might we do? I might do another one and just increase the exposure on Johnny's beard so it just doesn't fall quite so much to shadow. Oh dear, that's a bit much. Sorry, Johnny. 
just something like that just to help it pop out we can maybe do a bit of clarity there as well but not too much otherwise it goes very you know almost looks like there's lots of gray in his beard but there's no gray he's got a wonderful uh russet uh shrubbery beneath his face although his hair has now all gone um uh so we'll have to do a reshoot or just do an edit um let's move over to let's actually move over to jane because she's got all this cool detail in her costume she's got these like leather braces and the belt all this stuff and i just think by bringing out some of that detail oh and in these feathers as well um just by increasing the exposure and the shadows a little bit and probably some clarity um we can just start to bring out that's maybe a bit too dark that we might not be able to bring those shadows back but certainly on the belt around here and it is literally just sort of roughly painting this stuff in but by using a soft brush and a low flow um, it means that you are steadily building up the amount of effect that you apply so you sort of keep painting over and the more you paint over the more it applies which is great we can just paint a bit more on her hair a little bit around here her face is because of the way that she angled her face up she's perfectly lit lovely shadow on this side lovely highlight coming in we don't need to do any exposure adjustments on jane just um a little bit to bring out the details in her costume and we're going to do the exact same over here on ellen we're going to try and make her hair stand out this braid her D, D dice a little bit on this coming around here a little bit on this hair around here and on a headdress thing And some of the details how much you want to do is kind of up to you for me this is a fantasy shot it's a dungeons and dragons campaign image basically so i wanted it to look particularly fantasy and you can kind of get that by doing this sort of brightening it's called dodging and burning um in order to kind of bring out those details and make it look um like it's it's be, been treated really well basically um but there we go. I think that's probably, probably it. What do you think? Let me know. Uh, yeah, I'm quite happy with this. And it's, you know, fine. You know, it's not a, it's not a Christmas photo. It's not a tree with your family gathered around it. But it is, if you excuse the costumes, you know, this could just be a nice group of friends. Or, you know, it could be your family getting together under the, um, under the lights in the back garden or something. And this is the sort of edits that you would do whether it is a fantasy photo shoot like this or it's uh, it's a family photo these are the the exact same tools the exact same techniques that you could use to really make like your family portraits pop and particularly if you're not with your family your whole family this year you know you could just do some nice photos of, of whoever you do have and then spend some time making them pop even more so that they're a real treat when you send them to the rest of your family maybe um there's a couple of others from the uh, D, D sheet but let's come back to those a little later on it's uh, eight o'clock now i've been going for an hour i'll um i'll do one or two more also have a little drink um actually the next one i want to show is uh, is this shot of the waldorf hotel waldorf astoria astoria in edinburgh it's a beautiful building the christmas lights look amazing and we've got Edinburgh Castle in the background. But this shot, obviously this back here is very, very dark. So what I've what I've done is I've basically, well, there's a potential that you could really ramp up the shadows and bring some of that detail back, but then we are going to be losing um, a lot of detail. It's going to, I don't think it looks great with just the shadows ramped up. So what I also did is I took a second shot with a much longer exposure and this has captured all of the detail here and that's a very very good thing that you can try doing if you are doing nighttime photos as i mentioned before with um uh, with this shot one of the problems with night photos is that you've got a combination of very very dark and very very bright highlights sometimes that can be very difficult to balance in just a single image because your camera might not be able to capture enough detail so by taking two shots, one bright, one dark, you can then blend those together. Now, the way I'm probably going to do this is take these over into Photoshop as separate layers and then show you how I would blend them together there. What I am going to do first, though, is just see 
what happens if I select both of these in Lightroom, right click, photo merge, HDR, it's probably going to look horrible. I mean, it doesn't really look... I mean, all right, let's, let's, let's see how it goes. It might, it might do a great job, and if so, then we've saved ourselves all the time in Photoshop. I mean, it's not done a bad job, has it? I mean, those highlights have been brought down for too much. Mm, yeah, the shadows over there. I actually think it has done a superb job. I don't think we need to do anything else with it. I'm pretty happy with that. And we've got a bit of bleed from the lights here, but I actually don't think, for me, that doesn't spoil the shot. If you see in this shot, um, you know, the light stops here. It doesn't sort of blur out in that way that it does on this. You can see how much it's sort of blurring out, but it kind of makes sense because it's a brighter image. So of course that light is going to spread. So yeah, there you go. I think that's done a really, really cracking job. So we can just carry on from here, quite frankly. Um, so what we're going to do, first of all, we need to uh, adjust the uprights using the transform tool again. I'm going to go like this, and I'm going to go like this, and it has pinged it up into place, go away, scamming people. No! You've seen behind the scenes at OBS. No. Bloody OBS. Uh, has that one gone upright? That doesn't look upright to me. doesn't look it at all, in fact. So let's do this. That's better. There we go. Something more like that. Um, Secret Agent Sam, is that car half there? Um, yes, it is half there. Um, it was moving, and we've also got the streaks from the bus. Now, that is kind of one of the problems, I think, of using the HDR merge tool, is that it hasn't done a great job with this. In fact, yeah, it, it has kind of taken away some of the cars. So um, I could show you briefly how I would do this in, in Photoshop, but let's just pretend that it's done a fine job for now while I do the rest of the edit. Um, Shy Violet says, uh, anytime we take pictures for Christmas, they always turn out super dark, so I'm taking notes big time. Uh, yeah, I mean, if, you, um, if you're doing nighttime shots, then longer exposures are great. Get your camera on a tripod. If they're indoors, then... Same same thing, really. Um, uh, if you're taking photos of moving subjects, of course, then you need a faster shutter speed just to freeze that motion. Um, with the long exposure, that was eight seconds to get that. Um, and that's why we've got this nice streak of the bus going on. And obviously, so anyone walking past will have just been a blur. So you don't want to do that if you're trying to take a photo of a person. But let's carry on. Shavala also says, um, what does the transformation tool do exactly? Um, it basically, when you draw those lines, when I put them in on the building here and the building here, you basically, hang on, you basically are telling Lightroom these lines should be vertical. So it takes your image and goes like that. So in that instance, it was the edges of the building that should have been, of course, going straight up. They weren't. They were going out at weird angles. So I draw those lines on top, and it just moves the building back into place. Um, there we go. And we're hopefully back into Lightroom, although let me know if it isn't. Uh, where was I up to? Oh, yes. So we've got bright highlights up here. So again, this is about using our selective tools to bring those back down. We can uh, drag in our brush, bring those highlights down, just like this. And also, I'm just going to run this over the lights here too because they are a bit overpoweringly bright. I'm not going to touch them on the ground though because I love how bright that is. Just like in the other one we did, we've got this excuse me, amazing reflections of the lights on the cobbles. It looks awesome. Excuse me. I have got hiccups and that isn't great when you're trying to do a live stream. Um, cool. Um, where was I up to? What were we doing? Let's have a look at our styles again. 
I'm not sure if I really want to apply any of those. In fact, I don't. I really like how this is looking already. One thing I don't like is that up here, because of the cast of the light that they're using on their building, this looks very green. So let's go to our hue, saturation, luminance, get that green, pull it down into the yellow. And I'm completely wrong. That isn't green up there. It's the yellow. So we need to get that yellow. There we go. Yeah, look how much difference that's making. Up there, it's very green. We pull it back and it gets to be a much more rich sandstone. Um, somewhere around there is spot on. Is it is in that's actually how it should look, which is nice. We don't want to do those greens too much because they are nice and Christmassy. It's looking good. Oranges, I don't want to touch loads. We need to bring it down just a little bit to keep it kind of in line with what we did with our yellows, and I think that's looking really, really nice. Do let me know. Um, but there's not a ton more that I think I really want to do. We can try and play with luminance and bring the yellows down a little bit because we tried to bring the highlights back with that brush, but because up here is all yellows, we can just say to Lightroom, no, darken our yellows and bring them all the way down. It looks ridiculous. Um, but we can just darken it just a little bit. We could maybe even bring up the oranges ever so slightly. Uh, the blues we can bring down. That's really nice because that's now bringing in a lot more of a rich blue from those lights which we can improve even more by just upping that exposure. You want to be careful, uh, exposure, saturation. You want to be careful with saturation because if we look down here, it's sort of burning in that color. And the more we go, you can see that it gets very, very weird. So you do want to be careful not to overdo it. I think something around there, plus 15, is looking okay. Um, let's have a look before and after. That's a huge difference, isn't it? We've now got all this detail in the castle. We've got great detail on the front of the um, on the front of the hotel. It's a real Christmassy scene. I like it a lot. Um, what about the dehaze? Because yeah, I'm going to up the dehaze. Dehaze is tricky. Sometimes it works. Sometimes it doesn't. And in this instance, what I wanted is. The HDR blend that we've done has taken out a lot of the contrast in the scene. And although I've tried to put some back, if you just use the contrast alone, um, it I don't really know exactly kind of how it does different contrasts. Dehaze is a form of contrast, just in the same way that like clarity is mid-tone contrast and texture is basically a, another version. Um, but so adding a little bit of dehaze, you can see it's just sort of made things a little bit richer. It's taken out some of that um haziness in the sky well literally it's called dehaze so yeah i think plus 11 to, to my eye looks pretty great so let's stick with that what do we think what do we think let me know let me know why i have while i have a drink um really enjoying um, doing these because these nighttime ones were ones I went and did after if any of you who are watching watch my last video where I talked about kind of losing losing your motivation and losing your spirit when it comes to photography is something that I've I've been having at the moment I think we all have um, to a large extent um, probably with all our hobbies and everything because of lockdown and particularly um, right now as well with, with lockdown having cancelled so many people's Christmas plans um, I've just found that the, I've, I've found myself going out with my camera less and less and enjoying doing so a little bit less to be honest and it's it's totally natural to do that and I did a video around why that's basically okay even as a as a professional like me it, you will have these these times when you just you kind of lose your focus a little bit pun slightly intended but I got some really, really nice comments um, on that video and that actually made me decide that, you know what, I'm going to take my camera out at night. I haven't done night photography in a long time and Edinburgh is beautiful at night, particularly after a rain when all of those cobbles become basically a mirror like they are here. So I went out and I was really excited to go out and take some photos again. So, um, and uh, yeah, that's, that's where I'm at at the moment. And um, actually this stream... I was going to do as a recorded video today kind of how to do these things, but I think it works better as a 
a live stream when you can um, when you can interact and ask questions so please do keep on asking questions if you have any questions that is um yeah there we go i um honestly don't think i would do a lot more to this shot um at this point i am literally just playing around just for the sake of it i feel like i've kind of done let's have a look at our color grading and then again maybe we could add in some some magentas into those shadows a little bit more orange in those highlights no maybe a little less what about some blue in the highlights absolutely no that's just horrendous bit of purple in the highlights don't hate that a little bit less of it though okay how about that off and on off and on a little bit more of a magenta -y glow maybe a little bit more festive let me know um but otherwise i think i'm probably done on that shot so hopefully that one has been helpful to see how i would go about doing an, an hdr blend with multiple shots and then you know using the straighten tools and doing those things to get this shot if you did need to do this in photoshop i did say i would come back to it you would select both those image actually you know what do you want to see it tell me if you want to no i've said i would don't be ridiculous andy come on just go and do it edit in open as layers in photoshop <laughs> first of all we see the holding still i created with my lovely hand painted christmas tree wasn't that delightful um so basically what you would do is using layer masks um which is down here that allows you to paint out bits of the image that you don't want so right now it's white if a layer mask is white then it is showing everything on that layer so if we invert that layer mask make it black now it is hiding everything in that layer uh, which means if you then paint get the paintbrush it's not a paintbrush something like this nice big brush and paint with even bigger brush maybe somewhere around Let's just go with 895 pixels. And then you can paint with white, use a low flow. You can just start and also a soft brush. You just start painting in where you want it. And you'd need to spend a bit of time kind of making sure that it lines up. I'm just sort of showing you the rough tools of how you might go about doing this make an even bigger brush you know something like this and that's when you can kind of you know it you would need to do more to do it but that is effectively in in under a minute hopefully roughly how you would do that sort of blend and then you've got both elements in that is essentially two images blended together you get the idea let's go away from that um and uh, at this point let's go back i think and do my one of my last couples of shots this one of luke um uh Shai violet says uh can we ask any question like how do you get into photography or is it restricted to only the photos on stream now you can ask any question you want um how did i get into photography um i mean on a personal level i got into photography just out of it being a pure interest i, I we always had cameras in the house when I was like very young. They were mostly those like um, disposable Kodak ones, which are now obviously we know are hideous for the environment. Um, we'd always like buy one of those and take it on a holiday, and I always enjoyed snapping away. When I was I think twelve or thirteen, I got a very very basic digital camera. I think it was one megapixel. It was the Fuji FinePix A two O two. Uh, which I really enjoyed, and I just loved taking photos um, on it and snapping away. Um, when I was 18, I bought my first digital SLR camera. It was a Canon 350D, and um, yeah, I was I was really, really into taking photos. The more I did, the more I enjoyed it. I loved learning how to take photos. So I was always going out, trying to take landscapes, trying to take photos of my friends skateboarding, and uh yeah, just kept it going, developing my skills. And then when I started working for CNET, I started needing to take more and more photos. I, I never, I was never employed by CNET as a photographer, but I need, started to having to take more photos to illustrate my articles if I was going 
out to maybe uh, see a thing or interview a person. I'd need photos. I started taking more photos of the products I was reviewing. Eventually, it became more and more part of what I do to the point of now it's at least half of what I do. So I very much consider myself a photographer for CNET. And, um, you know, a number of years later, I am doing it both professionally and still uh, personally. Um, yeah, it's just been one of those things. Uh, and yes, Nate says that Fuji was two megapixels. He was right. It was. It was two megapixels. And eventually I upgraded to my 350D, which was eight megapixels. Eight whole megapixels. It's a nice camera, though. Anyway, we're looking at this shot of Luke, um, or Dob, rather, in his as he is in character, doing a excellent rock pose with his drinking horn, having a good old time. Again, let's start off with a crop. Uh, 4x5, because it just helps us tighten the scene. We don't need these lights in the top. And there's a lot of kind of wasted space at the top and bottom. That. That's our crop. That looks pretty good. It's very dark, so we can up that exposure um, a little bit. Not too much, because the more we go, the more we start to see... The bush is behind and the grass below. And you start to kind of lose that um, that drama that you get from it being this one overhead light. This looks very kind of moody and arty and then suddenly it's just, it's just a guy standing in a garden. So we want to be careful. So I'm going to up it a little bit, just enough to kind of bring out those details. Um, uh, but the rest of it, we're going to again use those selective tools first tool is going to be the spot removal because over here of course we've got a metal pole from the leg of the lighting rig and again we just go painty painty paint over the top and um, and then we just tell it to replace um, we can turn down that feather and there we go it's gone Lightroom does a very good job sometimes of getting rid of objects so before and after you would not know that that light stand was ever there, which is exactly what we want. Okay, let's play. I think our white balance actually on this shot is pretty good, pretty good. Um, I'm going to start, though, with a, a color toning preset. A6, let's go A6. Um, our highlights are a touch bright, um, but that's it. The rest we're going to do with our brushes, and we're going to start off on the uh, amazing details on Luke's costume here. We're going to really kind of amp up that exposure, amp up the shadows, very much amp up the clarity, because it's got these nice leather details on these belt straps and around here. And look how much suddenly those details have come to life. You don't want to do it on everything. You just want to kind of selectively paint it on the bits that need it. Which is these bits around here. Um, little tip if you kind of you are zoomed in, you want to move around. If you press and hold the space bar, then your cursor turns into a hand and you just drag around. So it's very easy to kind of get around when you're using a tool. Paint it on here, paint it on his arm, bringing out those details. A little bit on the horn. There we go. I can think maybe a little bit more on this belt. There we go. If we just turn that before and after, look how much more you can see the cool details. You can see all of that grain on this leather. It looks really, really nice. Oops. Um, I want to do the same on the fur around here. Um, I'm going to reset the effect. I want to bring the shadows, no, I don't, highlights down a little bit. And again, up on that clarity because it's the clarity which is going to carve out all of the details on those individual hairs make it look really cool Doodle -doo -doo. and kind of once the good thing is as well you know once you've sort of painted this effect in it's not finished you can go back and you can change it you can add more clarity take it away we could add texture to bring out the details even more which does look good Shadows actually drop a little bit in highlights. Yeah, something like that. 
Loads of detail standing out on that. That's cool. Shavilet says, did you tell the group how to pose for these photos or did they just do whatever they wanted? Um, I think it was about half and half. Um, their uh, producer, John, and their other producer, James, um, had they'd kind of decided on um, like the different shots they wanted to get. So they knew that they wanted to do this shot of them gathered around the microphone doing this cool um this cool thing so i was kind of going along with that um snapping away directing them a little bit between video takes on what to do and then afterwards for the um individual ones i was kind of trying to guide them a little bit so, so that the shot looked balanced and that everyone was lit properly and then on um, their own ones uh i'm pretty sure it was basically i just said i'm gonna keep snapping away you do you and they did they very much did um which was which was great because you know these guys are pros and they're performers they know what to do and it's a pleasure shooting people like that because they just know what to do and i have to do very little here's our before here's our after again the thing to note is how much detail we've got here it's things like that bringing out those fine details that really kind of can take your shot from looking just like a plain snap to looking like a more professional, more polished image. Um, so you know what? I don't think there's loads more this needs. But you can up that a little bit. I might actually bring that white balance down just a little bit. But we want to keep the tones fairly natural. And I really like what we've got. I should really you know pay attention to luke's hair he likes his hair because he's, he's got good hair and if we just add some clarity to the hair strands look at that it's a little touch but just carves that detail out a little bit tiny tiny touch you might never know that i did it but it does just make a difference yeah i really like the shop um i don't remember if it's one they've used uh, for anything. So if you haven't seen this before, then an exclusive look behind the scenes. Um, last one, though, of Ellen in her character as Meryl Wen. This is the one that I think they do. I, sh I think she uses this as um, like her character's profile image when they do their um, or when we do their videos. So let's do a crop. I'm going to try and keep this one fairly quick and, and wrap it up because time's ticking and We've all got things to do. But I loved this shot. Um, because we've got this... Ellen's got a, this twinkle in her eye, which makes I think just makes her seem even more elven-like. Um, which is great, the way that light is falling um, across her face. I just think it looks really cool. Uh, so, kind of same thing as before. We do need to increase that exposure, and we do need to increase those shadows um, just a little bit bring down the uh, temperature and straight away I think we're off to a good start um, isn't this Ellen's Twitter profile pic asks Gentle Mandrill uh, maybe yes it may well be um, if it is then good choice on her part because um it's a good photo. Let's um, let's increase the whites. Maybe bring down those highlights just a smidge because they're a little bit bright on here. You don't want to go too far. And we're going to do some more selective edits again, just like we did before. And we're going to start with her hair. In fact, let's zoom out a little bit less just so we can see what's going on. Nope. Go away. There we go. Something like that. Uh, bring back our brush again clarity shadow highlights whites and then we can paint this in over the top of her certainly her braid i want that to stand out and on here and i'm a little bit on just some of the curves of her hair not all of it where it's already catching the light i want to emphasize that and maybe a bit on her hands because they're also catching the light a little bit on the D&D &D dice. 
and the flowers coming down here. Cool. Let's have a look at before and after. It's great, isn't it, how much of a difference those few edits make. It's like how much that hair pops off the off the screen more. Um, it's already 90% done. That's 90% of what I did for, for these shots. Like they really needed so little work. Um, I think some of the stuff I did when I did the first edits for this, I actually did over in Photoshop, and I'm, I'm actually going to show you those now. So let's take this over into, over into Photoshop. Um, let's duplicate that layer so that we can just go back to, to this if we need it. Um, one of the things I think I did was just add in a bit more... Uh, I think I, didn't, I might have added in a bit more blue into the hair up here because the way the light has caught it, it's looked a little bit more washed out. But I'm not going to do that now, just in case I was wrong. Um, I would do things like... You know, it was a, a long day. We had some sort of stray hairs. You know, you can literally just paint over with the um, with the spot removal tool any strays. But, you know, she'd neaten the hair up so much that really needed very little, very little work. Um, but, you know, diligent photographer that I am, you just kind of go through and get rid. But there's very, very little. And you can see how, how easy it is to do that sort of thing. Um, in Photoshop. No, that didn't really work. Um, yeah, looks great. Um, but, you know, if you kind of really want to pay attention to the tiny details and make sure that not a hair is out of place. Because also we're shooting outdoors and it was windy and it was cold, whereas if you were doing like a professional portrait shoot in a studio, you'd probably have a controlled environment. You'd probably have a hair, um, hair stylist, a makeup artist, all of that. Um, yeah, but these guys don't need it because... Well, they're pretty used to getting in their costumes properly by now. Um, that's cool. Um, what else might I have done? Uh, I don't really think I did loads. I'm just have, trying to have a look. I think, I think the only thing I might have done is apply what's called the Orton effect. Now, the Orton effect is something that I normally only use in some landscapes, but it basically gives like a glow. And I'm going to show you exactly how to do it, exactly why it might work. First of all, you need Photoshop or a similar tool that has these these tools that I'll show you. Duplicate that layer. You add an adjustment, a levels adjustment and you whack up the contrast to just an incredible amount, something like that. It looks awful, um, but don't worry, we're going to fix it. Then we go to filter, blur, Gaussian blur, and we blur it a lot, all the way. Something like that, 40 pixels. So that is our blurred layer. But the great thing is, we now then take that opacity, we take it down to zero, and then you gently increase it and as you do look at that kind of blur and, and contrast start to pop back in this is a, a tool that you need to use incredibly subtly is because as soon as you start to go too far look it just goes, goes a very weird halo-y blur around ellen which we do not want is at 25 percent i almost never use the autumn effect any more than eight percent but right now all those details are so crisp because it's taken on a high resolution DSLR. And so you kind of want to have that slight slight soft filmic look that you would get from like a film camera. And so as I increase it, let's take it to 8% and then I'll turn it off and turn it on. Look how much of a difference that has made. Her skin glows, you've got this amazing, um, more like fantasy feel to it now and I only use this on Ellen's um, shot because she's this magical woodland elf that it really kind of I feel that sort of magical thing fits this this really works for it in a way that you know Corazon grizzled pirate does not need a soft 
focus glow nor would he appreciate me doing it but i think it works so well to give that sort of ethereal effect um yeah so let me know what you think but that is kind of just one thing that i did that totally i think totally transforms this image um what we can do is just now go and um actually you know what i can show you how i would use some of the other presets in in layers um, I've, sh I've shown it many times but i'm not sure i've shown on the live stream um, i'm just going to hold uh, command or alt and go merge visible that's going to merge all those layers into a new layer but it's not going to get rid of those layers in case i want to go back i'm also going to duplicate that layer so we've got two and the reason is is because on this new top layer filter camera raw filter this brings up the same tools that you've got in lightroom uh, which also means I have access to my presets. So I can go over here and we can scroll down and find exactly the same ones that we had before. So straight away, I can see that I love this A5 raw. I love like that blue tone that it's applied. So I can click that, press OK, but it's a little bit much. So I'm going to tone it down. Usually I tend to start at 0% and then dial it back up until it gets to a point where I'm happy which for me is somewhere around around 60. I think that looks really, really nice. So I'm using a preset, but I'm only applying a bit of it. I'm not just one click putting the whole effect on my image. I can then, because I've duplicated that layer, merge it down, duplicate it again, and now we can go in and apply another preset over the top, which is going to change our color toning um, again. And it's going to give us a different look. In this instance, I really want to apply A4 raw half because it gives this sort of almost old-fashioned sepia tone. But as before, I'm going to tone that opacity right back, which now is going to mean it's blending with the previous preset that we used. So you, we're going to get like a merge of these two looks. We're going to have the blue of the previous one bringing in some of those other tones. So now we've got a completely unique look by blending those together. And you can do that as many times as you want. Sometimes I will keep on uh, merging those layers, duplicating, adding a different effect, building them up and stacking them to get uh, just to get that color tone in a way that you want. Um, so yeah, I think that looks really nice. Let's just take a look without our color presets. It's a nice snap, but with suddenly looks so much more cinematic um, and so much more like a polished image. What do you think? Hmm. Gentle Mandel says, what? You can use Lightroom tools in Photoshop? Noted that. Yeah, you can. It is Camera Raw, um, the Camera Raw filter. It's the same uh, tool basically, that will open if you just open a raw file directly in Photoshop. First of all, you will need to do the raw processing, which is basically what Lightroom is. It is a raw processor. Um, and so, yeah, that just brings up the same tools. So, oh, very, very, very convenient. Um, so there we go. I'm going to press Control S, save. That's going to bring us back over into Lightroom where our image is. And so we can see this is what it was like, the raw file, straight out of camera, no adjustments made. And then this is what we've done. We've got that glow. We've got more of a light hitting on um, Ellen's face. I, I just think it looks like a really, really nice shot. And it's got a real filmic, cinematic quality that we just did not have in the first one without that glow effect. This looks very overly sharp. It looks very digital. And now we've got something which frankly looks magical, like you know, like, like her character is supposed to be. So there we go. That is how I would process that. And I'm showing you that because that is a tool that you can use on your own um, shots. I have tried it on uh, Christmas shots before. Um, it's very, very, it's almost cheesy, that kind of soft focus Christmassy look. And um, but it is something that you can that you can give it give a try, and you can do that with any image. It doesn't need to be a a um, well produced DSLR shot. You can take a shot from your iPhone, and you can try applying that sort of soft focus effect, 
and see what it does. It will work really well for shots that have got like your Christmas tree in, things that have got a lot of bokeh, that nice out of focus um, effect, because it will add that glow, adds um, adds that sort of ethereal um, feeling to your shots, which um, I think would look uh, look really good. I mean, we could try. I haven't tried it. Let's give this a try, actually, just for the sake of argument. Edit in Photoshop. We'll see what it looks like. We'll do it quickly. Duplicate, adjustments, levels, massive contrast. Clip it to that. Go to this, filter, blur, Gaussian blur, loads, and then opacity. Bring it right back down. And then, yeah, actually, yeah, I like it. I like what it's doing. Again, not too much. 8%, 8% is what I almost always use. It's the sweet spot of when it's enough to give the nice effect, but it's not overpowering. And look, I was right. I should have done this when I did before. Before, very sharp. Afterwards, this lovely glow. It's like the lights themselves are glowing outwards even more. I love it. Yeah, that's really nice. Those, um, those softened details. Yeah. Isn't that nice? What do you think? I think I... Personally, I think I should have done this on my first shot. But I didn't. So here we go. Um, and the cat is called Hugo. Um, I believe someone commented on my Instagram post and said, oh yeah, that's our cat around here. It's called Hugo. Which is nice because I used to foster a cat called Hugo who was beautiful. Anyway. So, um, I think, though, that brings me to an end. Um, I will spend a little bit more time if anyone wants to ask any more questions about any of my photos, any of kind of the, the techniques that I use that you may have seen in any of my other shots, how I, how I do certain things, how I got into it. It doesn't need to be about shots you've seen. Frankly, it doesn't even need to be about photography. If you want to know anything else, ask away. Um, I will say, actually, at this point, whilst we're doing the um, uh, the shots with these guys, thanks to Luke, who gave a big shout-out to my channel on his live stream yesterday. Um, if you don't know Luke, he's this one here, a nice guy in the back. And um, he has a channel called Key West Away, and he does lovely things. He does readings of, of old um, gothic horror. He's also done some Lego builds, all really, really nice, gentle streams to have on at a gentle time. Mm. <laughs> Lots of people loving Hugo. Um, Nate says, nice stream, dude. Um, thank you. I haven't yet ended, but we're getting there. Uh, I'm looking over at the comments. I'm also seeing me in the top right. And um, I'm glad to say that my hair hasn't gone poof, um, throughout this stream. I tried to smooth it down a little bit. Because... Uh, it is quite long. It's now been a year since I've had it cut because I haven't dared go into any um, any hairdressers. So it's never been this long before. Start of the year with it very short. But time makes fools of us all. Uh, David Galanti says, how much equipment do you carry when you go out in general? Um, David, that's a great question. And it really, really depends. Um, I am a gear hog. I love getting lots of different gear and... Um, I'm trying to I'm trying to row back on that a little bit. If I'm going away on like a dedicated photography trip and I know that I'm going to want to get a variety of different things, I always do tend to kind of overpack and I will take like my camera body, like a Canon 5D4, I will take a a wide 16-35mm lens, I will take a standard 2470 lens and I will take a telephoto 70 to 200 lens. I will also take filters like a neutral density, a circular polarizer. I will also take a tripod. Um, I will also take spare batteries and maybe my iPad so I can edit on the move. And, you know, suddenly I've got a, a, a big kit bag on my back, which weighs half a ton. So I've tried in, in, in kind of the recent months, um, particularly as I haven't actually been traveling. I've just been doing like either little day trips or just walks around um, Edinburgh. Um, just to take one camera, and that one camera is a Sony RX1. It's not here, um, but it's a. It's essentially it's a compact camera, but it's a pro compact camera. It's got a um, full frame sensor, really nice bit of kit. I did a video fairly recently on um, uh, how important it can be to 
take less gear on a photo shoot because sometimes if you just take loads of lenses, loads of things, you've given yourself so many options of how to photograph a scene that it can be really difficult to work out the best way to shoot that scene. And you end up being too obsessed with the gear and not what the photo needs, not what the scene needs to be captured well. So it's sometimes great to go out with just one lens on your camera or even just maybe your phone and um, and working with what you've got, not just zooming in and out, but moving around the scene to think about that composition, think about what elements you want to have in there. So that is a very long-winded way of answering a question, but there you go. Uh, uh, Chaval that says... Uh, you allowed me to use one of your photos as a wallpaper a while ago. I did. I had a question about how you made the reflection of the water look so clear. Um, that was a shot which I will try and bring up if I can find it. I think I've just gone back to me. So you don't all have to see all of my nonsense in Lightroom. And you get to see how... You don't have to see, rather, how horribly messy my workflow is, because you'd all be disgusted. Um, the photo that Shy Violet is talking about, I actually can't find. Anyway. Yes, I can. No, I can't. Oh, I can't because it's not in this, um, in this uh, software. It's in this one. It's in regular Lightroom, not... Uh, Lightroom, whatchamacallit. Talk amongst yourselves while I do this sort of nonsense. Um, where is that photo, though? I definitely took it. It is here. Here it is. I found it. And now we can go back to picture. Picture is this photo with this, with this uh, reflection. How did I make it so clear? The answer is I didn't. This is a image of this is just an image I took in the early morning. The um, the reflection of the lake was uh, the the lake itself was quite still, so it, it gave a good reflection. Um, I did very little to this shot to make it what it is. Um, it was a beautiful morning. It was just after sunrise, which to be fair was about nine o'clock, but we don't get a lot of daylight here in winter. Um, so we had these gorgeous autumnal colours and I really didn't have to do much to make it as clear as it was. If it was a day when it was raining or really windy, there would be a lot more ripples and so you wouldn't get quite as crisp a reflection. So instead it wasn't. It was, you know, we have a couple of reflections here that's sort of disturbing the tree. Um, but for the most part, it's pretty still. That's how you get a clear thing. You know, if you don't, if it's not a day with bad weather you and you usually go earlier in the morning, you can get pretty still water. That's how you can get nice reflections. The other way you can also do is use a very long exposure, of like 10 or 15 seconds, so that all that motion in the water blurs out. It won't be crisp details. It will be very hazy, but it will look smooth, if that makes sense. Um, some nice compliments of this uh, uh, of this photo. So thank you very much. Shy Violet is also asking about the owl. Yes, um, I think I mentioned uh, Gwen at the beginning of the stream, but this is uh, Gwen, my festive owl. One of the, my favourite things I've bought this year. Um, I was just looking for Christmas decorations and I happened on John Lewis to find um, this owl, which when I bought I thought was maybe going to be this sort of height, at least at least half half her size. So when I took her out of the box and found that she was massive and beautiful, I was very, very pleased. Um, she's been living in my Christmas tree. She's very happy. Um, but uh, because she's so beautiful and has brought so much joy to my life, she's going to stay out all year. She does not deserve to just be a Christmas decoration. She deserves to live in my house, pride of place all year. So there we go. Um, one last question, says David Galante. Do you develop some visual problem over the years? Do you develop some visual problem over the years? Apologies for the bad English. Um, visual problem. Oh, maybe um, like a problem with my eyes, maybe like with my glasses. Um, uh, I don't. I, I think my my eyes have got. If if that's what you mean, um, I think my eyes 
my eyesight has maybe got a little bit worse with age. Um, I didn't wear glasses until I was about 24, 25. Um, I'm a little older than that now, but um, I am used to wearing them. Um, but uh, my eyesight generally is okay. Um, it's it's fine. So I, I sometimes don't wear my my glasses and I don't need um I don't need contacts um because my eyesight really isn't that bad um but no I haven't really had any um I don't really have any major problems with my eyesight um not enough to cause a problem for photography which is which is good because obviously um I do kind of rely on um, on my eyes um for this um oh David says I'm so sorry for his bad English but no 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 not at all you know I um you were that was that was very clear I just wanted to make sure that I was answering the question um correctly um your english is very good um and i could be no judge i speak no second language um which is terrible of me i am ashamed i should speak more languages but i do not i speak well i can order beer in about five languages but um you know that's what happens when you frequently work in different countries you just need the essentials and that's just beer um, Shai Violet says, do you sell prints of your work anywhere? Now, <laughs> that was going to sound like a brag. Um, I was, was going to say, I've been asked that a lot recently. Um, I have I have been asked. It, it has it has come up. And um, no, right now I don't sell any prints. I don't sell things like calendars or cards or, um, or basically anything. I don't sell anything. I The only thing I do is, um, you know, is, is I just do my job. Um, I, I don't make any extra money any other way uh certainly don't make any money doing uh, this on youtube um does anyone make money on youtube i don't know some people must do i certainly don't it costs me a fortune um what was my point prints thank you um uh no i'd like to but the problem is is that to sell prints um there are two ways you can do it you can either um basically have a service where you me the photographer has no input someone buys a print through a service and they print it off they take a cut i take a cut but i don't really want to do that i don't really like the idea of having no control um so if you use a lab service a lab print then it's um uh then um yeah you know you'll get good results but you don't make very much money off it and frankly i just don't think it's gonna be worth my time what i would like to maybe look into is is having my own uh professional printer but they are very expensive the ink is very expensive the paper is very expensive and you you know to for me to print one photo it could cost like 40 50 pounds my costs then when you include things like postage i would need to be charging at least 70 80 pounds for even a small print to make it worthwhile and quite frankly i don't think anyone would bother buying my stuff like i like what i do i'm very proud of my work but i i'm not a i'm not a world-class photographer and i i just don't think correct me if i'm wrong but i just don't think people would be wanting to pay big money to buy um my prints but i've had enough people ask recently that it is something i might try to do on a very very limited run like i might do a limited edition run of like five signed prints and that maybe some people might want to um some people might want to spend that money but um yeah frankly i don't flatter myself to think i could make big money off selling my photos as prints maybe a calendar if you'd be interested in a calendar for 2022 um, God, that seems like a long time away, but it's not, is it? Hmm. Um, there we go. Uh, actually, there are people in the comments saying that they would buy one. Well, thank you very much. Um, I mean, you will, of course, be the first to know if I start doing prints. Of course, I will put that up on uh, uh, put up on my channel straight away because I will need to advertise the hell out of it to make sure that enough people see it. Um, yeah. Um, Danny McNamara says, I know some people who make a living out of YouTube. Um, yeah, I do. I mean, obviously, the uh, um, Oxtra and um, Oxbox guys, that, that is what they do. I, I, I also know plenty of people, but I think you kind of need to have a lot of, uh, a lot of followers to start making um, 
making money off advertising. I, I as a little look behind the curtain, if uh, you know, if you're interested, I I have um, coming up to I think four thousand subscribers, which I'm extremely pleased with. I love the kind of a little community that we have here. I've, I love the, the the regular commenters who come in. The, it's the same names that keep coming up again and again, which is incredible. I love talking to people. I, I get a I get a lot of joy out of doing this channel. Um, it makes nothing um, at all, and the amount I spend in um, traveling to places and doing things and buying gear and stuff like it. it I spend way more um, on doing my photography than I could ever hope right now to make back off YouTube. Um, so um, just, you know, I know there are many people who do make good money um, and I am in no way complaining that I don't. As I say, I love doing this. And also, crucially, I am not a YouTuber nor am I trying to be. I have a job as a professional photographer and a, and a tech journalist. Um, this is what I do. My channel is what I do for fun. So um, uh, I'm not looking for, for pity <laughs> or anything like that. Um, but I think that probably should bring me to an end. If there are any last questions, get them in now because I'm going to wrap things up because clearly uh, I've come to the end of what I had planned and now I'm just drinking and chatting. Um, and I've almost been going for two hours. Um, what I will say though is a little uh, wrapper. Wrapper? wrap up um is that this will be my, this is my last video for the year um it's been an incredibly difficult year for a lot of for everyone for obvious reasons and um isn't necessarily looking like that's going to change anytime soon um so i really really hope that um everyone can enjoy christmas and the festive period as much as is possible um and i want to thank everyone again for um being so great so supportive of this channel um it's grown hugely um this year uh and i'm and i'm absolutely thrilled about that um i've definitely got some really good stuff planned um for the new year and for the coming months obviously you know lockdowns and situation depending but i also would love to hear if anyone has any specific things they'd like me to do obviously like my videos so far have basically been what I want to do or I've decided to go on a photo shoot and make a video around it but there may be specific things like oh hey I want to take some portraits what are your tips and I could maybe do something around that so do please feel free to to chime in if you've got any um, specific requests yourself but um, uh, at this point also if you like the streams this stream probably has been um, far more rambling and uh weak source than i intended but um if you do like my streams generally um I, I kind of hoped to do them weekly um if that would be of interest please let me know because um at the moment you know i'm not too it's lovely having kind of people here but i get relatively very very few views um on um, on on live streams so i'm not i'm never really too sure if people are that bothered um so you know if they're not then what's the point um but you know it's nice to have um it's nice to have the people uh, coming who are doing but i am totally rambling at this point so i am going to wrap up uh thank you all so much for being part of everything that's been going on so far i hope you have a wonderful festive time i hope to see you all again in the new year um you can find me on twitter and instagram with at battery hq if you have not uh, followed me um there already uh, please do and please feel free to to reach out through um instagram um, or twitter with any other questions you might have any suggestions um anything like that feel free uh, otherwise um hope you all have a wonderful time and i will see you in 2021 And also now I'm just waiting to see if um, I definitely ended the stream. Otherwise I'm just sitting here.